Greetings and welcome to the Daily Article Podcast for Thursday, January the 4th, 2024. I'm Chris Elkins narrating today's article written by Denison Forum co-founder and CEO, Dr. Jim Denison. As the third anniversary of the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol approaches, attention is being focused on the question, was it an insurrection? As of October the 22nd, the approximate losses from the events of that day totaled more than $2,881,360. Approximately 140 police officers were assaulted, more than 1,100 people have been charged in connection with the event, and more than 600 have pleaded guilty to federal charges. Five people died in the riot. But was it an insurrection? The question matters enormously since two states have now barred former President Trump from appearing on their election ballot after claiming that he participated in such an action on January the 6th. They cited Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which forbids those who previously held office but have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States from holding office again. Section 3 does not specifically include the presidency among its listed offices, leading some to argue that it does not apply to Mr. Trump. Others question whether the January 6th event constitutes an insurrection. If it does not, they claim that Section 3 does not apply to the former president. The latter question is obviously relevant to our national politics, but there's an even more foundational issue here that speaks to the future of our democracy. The Cambridge Dictionary defines insurrection as an organized attempt by a group of people to defeat their government and take control of their country, usually by violence. I want to emphasize the three elements that make up this definition. An organized attempt, defeat their government and take control of their country, and violence. Some point to the violence of January 6th as justifying this description. Others claim that the object of the riot was to prevent a legitimate president-elect from assuming office, thus constituting an insurrection by virtue of the second definitional element. However, others cite the first element, an organized attempt, as invalidating the charge of insurrection. They note a Reuters report, quote, The FBI has found scant evidence that the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol was the result of an organized plot to overturn the presidential election results. The article adds, The FBI at this point believes the violence was not centrally coordinated by far-right groups or prominent supporters of then-President Donald Trump. Some even believe that the riot was instigated by law enforcement to suppress political dissent. The partisan nature of this issue is enormously significant. In a poll published this week, 55% of U.S. adults agreed that the storming of the U.S. Capitol on January the 6th was an attack on democracy that should never be forgotten. But note, 89% of Biden voters agreed with the statement, contrasted with 17% of Trump voters. Democracy translates the Greek word demokratia, from demos, meaning the people, and kratia, meaning power or rule. As Abraham Lincoln so memorably proclaimed, the American democratic experience entails government of the people, by the people, for the people. As George Washington and many others have noted, such consensual governance requires shared values derived from shared religious convictions. But these shared values require a shared vocabulary by which to understand and communicate them. Even more foundationally, the exercise of consensual governance itself requires a consensual vocabulary by which people choose leaders, enact jurisprudence, and enforce laws. If words become weaponized for partisan purposes, the fundamental means by which democracy exists and functions is undermined. This is where we find ourselves in America today. As consumers in a consumption-based society, everything and everyone has become a potential commodity. We purchase those goods and services that we believe are worth more than their cost. In a postmodern, post-truth culture, we feel free to do the same with our words, using them in whatever way suits us and advances our agendas. Consequently, millions of Americans believe their former president, currently leading in polls to become the next president, is a 
quote-unquote insurrectionist who is therefore constitutionally barred from office. Millions of others believe this charge to be yet another illegitimate attempt to deprive Americans of their constitutional right to vote. The chasm between these two positions is dangerous to our future as a nation. The demise of a shared vocabulary and the objective reality it describes is an existential crisis for any democracy. Our response as Christians should be to pray fervently and work redemptively to help our nation turn to the one true God and the objective, authoritative truth of His Word. Such a moral and spiritual reformation is vital not only for the spiritual health of Americans, but for the future of America. As we pray for others, however, we must take care to pray for ourselves as well. I'm as tempted as anyone to commodify biblical truth, buying those parts that appeal to me, and refusing those that do not. Every time you and I do something Scripture forbids or do not do something it requires, we make this choice. From Genesis 3-5, we exercise our will to power by choosing to be our own God, the foundational sin behind all sins. In doing so, we forfeit God's best for our lives and for those we influence. And from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, we abandon our calling to be salt and light in a broken culture, dying for purity and truth. By contrast, every time we choose to think biblically and act redemptively, we glorify our Lord and advance His kingdom in eternally significant ways. The higher the cost of such obedience, the greater its value in this life and the next. If you were to live even more biblically than you do now, what would you change first? Why not today? Note, a new year brings the promise of change. We pray that our new and free online course, The Greatest Commandment, will draw you to the Father's heart over the next five weeks. In this self-directed course, you'll learn why Jesus linked loving God with loving others and how you can better exercise each of those aspects of your faith. Find a link to the course in today's episode notes. Thank you for being a Daily Article podcast listener. If you find the Daily Article podcast helps you better understand today's news and cultural issues and then respond biblically, please share the Daily Article podcast with others.